Good afternoon, everyone. How to have a shoe change. Oh, welcome. We are so happy that you're here today. My name is Faith Yakubian. I use she, her, they, their pronouns. And I'm the executive director of the Vermont Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Please let me know if you're unable to receive my voice. I will do my best to increase it or decrease it. Before Commissioners Mackin and Schultz formally welcome everyone today, I have a few acknowledgments and logistics to go over. We have ASL interpreters here today. Thank you, Sydney and Alyssa for being instrumental to our work and to make it possible for folks to engage and participate. This is a hybrid event, and as such, we have partnered with the Extraordinary Media Services. The company is called Onion River Community Access, or ORCA. They are providing an online option for those of you who are participating virtually, and welcome. For those attending online, Executive Assistant Ann Miller or I will be viewing the chat to respond to your comments and questions should they arise. We do have a bathroom. It is toward to my right, lower part of the lawn. It is accessible. We do have lunch option as well. Thanks to the beloved members of People's Kitchen, uh, Farid to name. Yes, please do applaud people as I name them. They will be serving an array of delicious food from vegan fried rice to barbecue chicken teriyaki. We also have beverages also to my right. Uh, we have hot water. We have tea for the hot water. We have hot cider. We also have coffee, both decaf and caffeinated. Please enjoy at your, at your leisure. We also have receptacles that are close to the beverages. The chairs that you're sitting on, that some of us are sitting on today, belong to the Unitarian Church of Montpelier. We wish to thank them, especially Reverend Javier Duval, for lending us their chairs. And I wish to thank Christine Hughes, director of the Richard Kemp Center, for connecting us with Reverend Javier Duval. We have some tables set up, one of which is the Vermont Truth and Reconciliation, where you can receive swag. We have a strategic plan booklet there as well. We have the agenda for today, and which also includes the speaker's bios. We also have an online form and a, and a hand copy form for feedback. We hope you will participate in providing feedback as it helps us evolve our work. And now, it is my pleasure to turn the mic to the commissioners, Mia Schultz and Melody Mackin, whom will offer a formal welcome. No. <laughs> I'm turning the mic over to Brenda, who will open the ceremony. My mistake. Kwe, Kwe Nadova. We're happy to be here today, not happy of why it brings us here and what's happened in the history of Vermont to our people and people of color. Um, my youth are here today to give you some of our culture, of our music, and I hope you really enjoy it, but uh, I appreciate everybody being here today. Thank you.
So that's the warrior song. Um, they just, Sage is, Sage stand up. She is a, one of our drum leaders. Jasmine is a drum leader. Sela is a drum keeper. Cody, um, I mean Carson, stand up. Piper, Hope, Matthew, and Paisley. These are just a few. We have over 30 kids at Circle this year. Last year we had 64. I cut it down some. It's too much. Um, they're going to do Acha, and then they'll do one more after that, and then Mel and Mia will take over. Thank you so much.
Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and Faith, just let me know that they can't actually do the chat. Sorry. <laughs> uh, they tried on Zoom. Uh, but anyway, um, so as we gather here today on the State House lawn, I want to first acknowledge the land that we are standing on, Mother Earth and the stories that she holds. This land, like much of Vermont, has borne witness to moments of beauty and moments of deep injustice. It has supported generations, even when we are not at our best. When the systems built upon it excluded, harmed, and silenced so many. Today, we are here to speak of those truths, to honor the voices of those who, for far too long, have been erased from the narrative of Vermont's history. When we think of Vermont, a common memory many cling to is one of independence and freedom. But we know, standing here today, that this memory does not tell the full story. Let me share with you the story of Dinah. Dinah's life is documented in Harvey Whitfield's The Problem of Slavery in Early Vermont, 1777 to 1810. In 1783, she was sold to Jotham White and then to Jacob, a judge from Windsor. For 17 years, she lived in bondage, enslaved in a state that we often boast was the first to abolish slavery. But Dinah's story is not unique. Her life and the lives of so many others challenge this common memory. Dinah, like others, was cast aside by the very systems that claimed to protect liberty. And when she became ill, she was warned out of town, no longer useful to those who once owned her. In her final days, townspeople took on the cost of her care, and yet Judge Jacob's name and power overshadow her life in the records. We know him, but only now are we beginning to know Dinah's truth. Dinah's experience is part of a much larger story. The land itself holds the weight of those deemed defective, feeble-minded, or simply other. Those who do not meet the narrow definition of what a Vermonter should be. We are here today to broaden that definition. We are here to tell the stories of those who were left out, cast aside, and discarded. This event, Truth and Healing in Search of a Common Memory, is our chance to reckon with the past, to honor those like Dinah, and to ensure that their truths are not forgotten. Today we are joined by speakers who will share their stories, their own truths. These are the voices that have been silenced for too long, voices that must be central to the work of the Vermont Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And today we also unveil our strategic plan, a plan that will guide our work for a little less than three years. This plan is rooted in truth telling and acknowledges the difficult history that has shaped the Vermont we live in today. It will provide a pathway forward, one that addresses these historical harms and lays out clear reparative measures. At the core of this plan is the question, who is a Vermonter? The answer is complex, but it must include everyone. Native Americans, black Vermonters, immigrants, people with disabilities, their families, LGBTQ communities, women, those living in poverty, and so many intersectional identities that we all have. This plan is not just about recognizing the past, but about building a future where every Vermonter's voice is heard and valued. The organizations and speakers we've invited here today are integral to this mission. They represent the lived experiences of the communities we are fighting for. From the Abenaki Circle of Courage to Outright Vermont, these organizations are the heart of the movement toward justice and equity in our state. They remind us that this work is not only about policy, it is about people, relationships, and communities. Let Dinah's story and the stories of all those you hear today remind us why this work is necessary. Let us commit to holding on to the truths of this land and place and its people as we move forward together. Thank you. Oh, and I'm Commissioner Mackin. <laughs> I'm gonna push this up. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mia Schultz. I am the other commissioner, I use she, her pronouns. Thank you for the circle of courage, for the lovely opening. And thank you all for being here and thank you to our guest speakers. And thank you, my fellow commissioner, Melody, 
for those powerful words and for reminding us of the history that we must confront as we look towards the future. I am honored to stand here before you as part of this important moment as we gather here for truth and healing in search of a common memory. I want us to reflect on how the legacies of the past are not confined to history. They continue to shape the present in real tangible ways. The injustices we inherited are not just relics of the past or a bygone era, they manifest in the systems and the structures that still exclude so many Vermonters today. And as we begin this important truth-telling process, we must acknowledge how deeply intertwined our present day disparities are with the past. Let's talk about the reality that we face. Vermont may pride itself on being progressive, but the truth is that many communities remain marginalized, especially people of color and people with disabilities. These legacies of exclusion are alive in the stark health disparities, employment gaps, housing inequities, and educational divides that disproportionately impact marginalized communities in our state. During the COVID-19 pandemic, these disparity, disparities were laid bare in ways we could no longer ignore. Black and other minority communities face higher infection rates, less access to care, and worse outcomes. But, we, but what, what became even more painfully clear is that people with disabilities, particularly those with cognitive disabilities, also bore a disproportionate burden. Many individuals with disabilities lacked the resources, the accommodations, and support they needed to protect themselves. For them, the pandemic was not just a public health crisis, but a reflection of a much larger society, societal failure. And the failure doesn't even end with healthcare. Consider the employment landscape in Vermont. Black and Hispanic Vermonters, despite having comparable educational backgrounds to their white peers, face higher rates of unemployment and underemployment. And the disparities for people with disabilities are even more staggering. Only 22% of Vermonters with cognitive disabilities are employed compared to 71% of those who are disabled, without disab disabilities. And when we look at individuals with co-disabilities, those numbers drop even further to a heartbreaking 17%. These are not just statistics. They represent real lives held back by systemic barriers. Income disp disparities further exacerbate these challenges with over 60% of Vermonters with cognitive disabilities that earn $25,000 a year, far below living a living wage. And for people of color, the story is similar with families facing higher rates of poverty and fewer opportunities for economic mobility. And this poverty is not just about income. It trickles down into every other aspect of your lives. Housing insecurity, lack of access to quality education, and even food insecurity. So let's talk about housing. People with disabilities are likely to face housing insecurity and discrimination when seeking loans or mortgages, just as black and brown Vermonters are more likely to face unfair treatment in the housing market and individuals with disabilities find themselves pushed into substandard living conditions and are forced to navigate a system that doesn't fully accommodate their needs. And when we turn to education, the story continues. Educational outcomes for students of color show significant gaps compared to their white peers, but students with disabilities face challenges at every turn 
often receiving inadequate support and accommodations, and this leads to lower graduation rates and limited opportunities for higher education and economic advances. The legacy of exclusion stretches across generations and it's time to confront it. The Vermont Truth and Reconciliation Commission strategic plan, which we launch today with you all, seeks to tackle these disparities head on and over the next almost three years, we will work to ensure that the voices of marginalized communities, those have been, who have been ex historically excluded and overlooked, are central to our truth-telling process. The stories we gather will inform our recommendations for reparative me measures that are not only symbolic, but, decide, but designed to create real change. We must transform the systems that have been complicit in perpetuating these inequities, whether it's healthcare, employment, housing, or education. And this is where truth telling comes to play. By listening to those who have been directly impacted, we will be able to identify where these systems have failed and how we can rebuild them or build them back in a way that is inclusive and equitable. Reparative measures are not just about acknowledging the harm, they are about fixing what is broken. We need to dismantle the barriers that prevent people of color, individuals with disabilities, and others from accessing the opportunities that they deserve. And the speakers that we brought here together represent the broad spoke spectrum of experiences and communities, communities that have been at the forefront for this fight, for this fight for equity. People like Sha'an Moliere from I Am Vermont too. People like Beverly Little Thunder, a Lakota activist here in Vermont. People like the Vermont Student Anti-Racism Network are youth who certainly lead the way. And of course, a powerful voice with Jay Covert, who works with the LGBTQIA uh, youth at Outreach. And Ali Diang, who works with immigrant communities in Vermont and reminds us that the American dream is not yet realized for so many. There are voices we must center in our work moving forward and we must address those inequities they face, not just in abstract terms, but through concrete actions that dismantle the structures that continue to hold them back. Today, with the launch of our strategic plan, we take an important step towards this journey and we are committed to truth telling, not just as a process of reflection, but as a catalyst for transformation. We are committing to ensuring that every Vermonter, regardless of their race, ability, or background, can live in a state that values their contributions and supports their full potential. This work will not be easy, but together with your support and the collective efforts of all of our communities, we can build a better Vermont that's truly inclusive, a Vermont where no one is left behind. So thank you all for being part of this journey because together is the only way that we can make this vision a reality. Thank you all. Thank you. Jay, you're up. Thank you, Commissioner Schultz, for that welcome, and thank you for welcoming me here today. My name is Jay Covert. I use they, them pronouns, and I am the school-based change manager at Outright Vermont. I also want to acknowledge that today is National Coming Out Day, and I can't think of a better day to come out with true telling of the histories that have been forgotten or ignored or left behind. Outright has the singular mission to build a Vermont where all LGBTQ plus youth have hope, equity, and power. 
We are committed to advancing liberation and social justice, building a more affirming and accountable society for all. However, we know that today's systems and institutions that make up our society, including Vermont's education system, maintain injustices and continue to exploit our differences, which perpetuates hate that profoundly impacts people's right to self-determination and joy. While Vermont may have some policies in place outlining support for LGBTQ plus students, we hear and see every day at Outright stories of harm in schools, against trans student athletes, against youth expressing their identities and affirming their pronouns, against youth trying to attend their school's GSA meetings. The national climate of fear and hatred shapes how, we, how youth here live their lives. Even without laws banning gender affirming care or restricting the teaching of diverse curricula, we do not need to wait until those laws are on Vermont's doorsteps to recognize that LGBTQ plus youth are at risk. In fact, it's more important than ever that we recognize that Vermont is not immune to the culture of harm seen in other states across our country. Youth are not involved in most decisions about their lives from their personal lives to policies and laws that govern their lived experiences. In a rural state like our own, isolation can run deep, separating youth from each other while restricting their access to information and resources. Alone, it's difficult for youth to affect change and influence their circumstances. And to build a society that works for all youth, they must be centered in the work. We all want to be a part of the decisions that are made about us. At Outright, we recognize that LGBTQ plus youth are the experts in their own lives, with unique insights and experience to lead change wherever they are. In centering youth, Outright is a partner on their journey to imagine and realize the world they deserve. Clearing the path for LGBTQ plus youth to set the agenda and bring their voices, talent, and passion forward. On these very steps, less than two years ago, and coinciding with that year's Trans Day of Visibility, youth organizers from Outright presented Vermont state leaders with a roadmap to a world where LGBTQ plus youth have hope, equity, and power. These were the demands for queer and trans youth autonomy. which were compiled from conversations led by the national youth-led organization, Queer Youth Assemble, infused with Vermont's own youth leaders, needs and priorities. I'll reiterate some of what our youth leaders have named as priorities for being in solidarity with them. Listen and include everybody. This means hearing everybody's story, youth or adult, even when others' priorities are not fully aligned with yours, show up and be in solidarity with the whole community. Be loud in uplifting and defending the voices of queer folks, even when they're not in the room. This document is only one intended path towards liberation for queer and trans youth, but it must be backed by actions and practices. Laws alone will not change the material reality that LGBTQ plus youth live and experience every day. Earlier this spring, Outright purchased Camp Sunrise, not only to ensure a permanent place for Camp Outright for our campers, but to allow us to expand our programming to support more LGBTQ plus and allied youth. Before Outright's acquisition of this property, it belonged to the local chapter of the Boy Scouts of America an organization with a long history of discrimination and harm. In 2000, less than 25 years ago, the Boy Scouts successfully argued in front of the United States Supreme Court their right to discriminate based on sexual orientation, based on the fear that even associating with someone who is LGBTQ plus would tarnish the values of their organization. And in that same year, just three days after the Supreme Court decision in Boy Scouts of America versus Dale, the Vermont Supreme Court ruled that same gender couples were entitled to the same benefits and protections afforded by Vermont law to married opposite sex couples through civil unions. 
Vermont's history is interwoven with our nation's history. 24 years ago, outright campers would not have been able to even attend the former camp Sunrise, and our purchase of the camp would have been unthinkable, and yet gay and lesbian couples were allowed to form civil unions. Maybe at that time, queer and trans youth saw hope in their future as adults, but what about their hope as youth? In a world that is centered around adults, we ignore that the lived realities of young people existing is not simply made better by the possibilities of their futures. Their current existence should also be full of boundless possibilities for joy. Yet here we are charting a new path for queer and trans youth to find hope, equity, and power in connection to nature. We have the opportunity to create new histories with and on the land without ignoring or forgetting the histories of harm that have taken place there and led to this moment. We can and must hold both stories for our memory. This is but one example that shows how the larger national landscape impacts youth locally. For the work of the Vermont Truth and Reconciliation Commission to be effective, we cannot ignore how national laws, policies, and practices have shaped how Vermont relates to LGBTQ plus youth. Our current reality is not separate from their histories outside of Vermont. In the search for a common memory, we must uplift and deeply listen to the truths shared by young people whose lived experience and expertise has been disregarded through the shaping of their worlds and laws and policies. Laws alone do not protect us, we protect us. And the only way to get free is through telling these truths, holding them with care, and making changes to honor these truths, to uplift power for all youth and LGBTQ plus youth in particular. Their lived experiences will not shift until there is a reckoning, not only by our state leaders, but by all of us, and truth telling of these ignored histories. Thank you. So I don't know about you, my soul is getting fueled. And I think that our bodies, I know they're connected, but I think our bodies could use some fuel as well. And so this is a good time to break and enjoy some food, get some food from people's kitchen. It's just a start. They will continue to serve until three o'clock, I believe Farid had said, three or 3.30. So let's, let's start that and we'll take a pause on the speeches. Thank you. and Maya here. <laughs> the Vermont Student Anti-Racism Network here. Or is. <laughs> Okay, folks, we are going to reconvene. That does not mean you should stop eating, though. Please continue to consume the delicious food. And now I'd like to introduce the Vermont Student Anti-Racism Network. Notably, Addie and Amaya are here today. You're also with others? Perfect. Ready? All right. I'm going to turn the mic over to them. Okay. Hi all, my name is Amaya and I'm a 12th grader at Rutland. Hi everyone, my name is Addie Lunster and I am a sophomore at Middlebury College. Uh, we will be talking about the education system and how it has impacted us. Speak up. Okay. 
Education systems are systems that continuously cause black children to become accustomed to ignorant comments and lessons that make us feel lesser than. Growing up in a mostly white state, I was always the only black girl in my classes. I am still the only black girl in my classes. Because of this, I've always felt responsible for educating peers, faculty members, and community members on microaggressions and discriminatory behavior. At a young age, I was looked at when we were on the topic of slavery. Seventh grade felt the hardest. I had my hair touched, heard comments on how my hair was pretty or straight, and was asked if my peers could have the N-word pass. But the worst of all was when we were forced to participate in a slavery simulation. White or black, every student knew that participating in the simulation was wrong, but the faculty felt that things like this broke barriers and was some way woke. Teachers preached that if the black students could do it, so could the white students. In my years in the education system, I have never felt more targeted. The explosion that happened after was one of the worst times. I was cornered by faculty members asking how I felt about the situation, like somehow my validation would prove to them that it was okay. That day, minorities in my school were subjected to ignorance and unconscious bias from teachers who were meant to be trusted adults. Beyond my experience, the education system has failed black children as far back as the 1900s when black kids were finally allowed access to learning. During this time, most African Americans were still educated in the way of separate but equal education with less funding than their ca white counterparts. In addition, they were not given opportunities to pursue higher education. Looking to modern times, black children in America still face separate but equal school systems. The United States education system has been recorded to be one of the most unequal out of all the industrialized world. The disparity between learning opportunities based on status is large. This disparity leads to black people continuing to not seek higher education. Because black people are consistently kept down due to economic status, they are less likely to request AP courses. Fortunately enough for me, I've grown up and had opportunities to seek higher learning. But I'm only one example out of the 41.6 million black children who still face inequalities. Tupac Shakur, a man who celebrated black pride in the Black Panther movement, once said, it's wrong to keep someone from learning something. I'm fed up. We gotta start teaching children that they can be all that they wanna be. There's much more to life than poverty. Conquer the enemy armed with education. No one will ever oppress this race again. In saying this, he's touching on the fact that those who grow up in a so certain social class don't seek opportunities outside of the ones they are given. They are often given the chance to enhance their education and that represents the inequalities in our society. When talking about local inequities many black students face, we must talk about the limited education and resources in regards to racial matters. A lot of schools in Vermont lack basic resources to, in their or school systems like equity directors or classes dedicated to studying race. Speaking from personal experience, not having these resources have met, has left people of color and other minorities facing traumatic experiences. While conducting interviews for a project I am working on about inequities in Rutland City Public Schools, I have found a common theme of discrimination and a lack of accountability taken. In various cases, black students and I have gone to administrators within the building requesting guidance when we've been victimized by the N-word or any other pointed verbiage. In these times of need, there is never any closure. We are accused of being the problem, gaslighted into forgetting it ever happened, and we are put back into the same classroom and environment as the perpetrators. Instead of taking pride in being black, many black youth find themselves dreading having this being part of their identity because of the racism that is bound to follow. To better Vermont for those who aren't considered the standard, education about the history that led to the reoccurring injustices and inequalities can stimulate change. Philosopher George Santana once said, those who cannot, re uh, cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. To completely change the persistent inequalities, we as a community must look through the past to the 100 years of slavery. As school embraced that, it is proven that empathy is increased and so is awareness which improves racial attitudes. I commend everyone who has carved out the time to be present today. Showing up for those who don't always have a voice is the first step to adopt new norms in society.
The education, education system is just one part of a whole that consciously or unconsciously further systemic racism. I leave you with a quote from Angela Davis, a black feminist and political activist who once said, you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world and you have to do it all the time. Never stay silent. Thank you. Thank you, Amaya. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Addie. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm a white student speaking on racism in the education system, a system which is inherently biased towards kids that look like me. Over my high school career, I have been learning and practicing how to transform the system from the inside out, often in little ways, pushing my peers to be co-conspirators and not just neutral, and not just the problem. I'm still educating myself. I live in America and hold biases, but I believe that if we understand how the system was founded and structured, we can deconstruct inequalities one by one and at the systems level. The fight is about all of us. We are all impacted and we all need to participate in it. When I was 15, I remember taking my first black studies class outside of school on an online platform because my school didn't offer it. Now I'm 20 years old and I'm majoring in black studies and sociology in college. I see these majors as a transformative study, a way to change the system through knowledge. But every day my peers and I risk getting pulled into the very system we are trying to change. I was sitting in my room in high school um, and I remember writing emails to superintendents around the state. This was in 2020 when George Floyd was murdered. I was asking superintendents to include black studies in the curriculum. The responses were on the one hand heartwarming, but out of a hundred or so emails, I got maybe 10 responses. So me and some other students took matters into our own hands. We started a nonprofit called the Vermont Student Anti-Racism Network, where we work to achieve education without racism through education about racism. We are a student-led group who works to create curriculum, lead lessons, facilitate discussions, and organize meetings and campaigns. And this journey, personally for me, has shown how easily one can get swept up into the everyday corporate world, the world of neutrality, the world of logistics and not the world of community building. Community building is what anti-racism and transforming systems is about. And that's what this truth and reconciliation work is about. I wanna talk quickly a little bit about history. So in the 1960s, protests erupted across college campuses led by black and Puerto Rican students, pushing for ethnic studies and comprehensive racial equity policies. They called for five demands at the City College of New York and held a strike on campus. This was not a singular event. It happened at schools across the country. It was in response to the failure of our education system to empower all students. It was rebellion and transformation led by young people. Since the inception of our country, we have been fighting back against systems that oppress us, in education and in other systems. Our constitution and founding principles were ones that did not include everyone, and so we must fight, even and especially the youngest generation. This is my call for all of us to speak out against injustice in all levels of the education system, because our education system is a microcosm of the real world. If we change our schools, teach the truth, as Amaya said, and provide equitable opportunities, we can fix the foundation of the, nation, of the nation and transform what it looks like. So I know my words may cause some to feel uncomfortable. Anti-racism work is hard for those of us who feel as though it is lessening our power. But let me tell you something. It is strengthening our power, our collective power, in a sustainable way. By coming together, we are building a better world for all of us. Through anti-racism work, I have seen the world through a different lens. A quote exemplifies this. In order to build the movement capable of transforming our world, we have to do our best to live with one foot in the world we have not yet created, by Aurora Levins Morales. We have to want to live in a world where we are all free, and if we're able to envision that, we can begin building it. I see teachers and students all over the state committing to this work, but it can be overpowered by hate and ignorance if we don't all stand up. 
So my call to all of you is to stand up, use your voice, like what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is doing. I'm so proud to know all of you are here doing this work. Um, and I also want to emphasize that it's important to listen. I spent a lot of my life like up here giving this speech, trying to be the catalyst for change, but that's not how it works. There are many different ways to transform the world we live in. Ultimately, we all have to come together and be part of it together and use our voices in the way that makes sense for us. Um, so I hope you'll take my and my words to heart today um, as students who are coming together from an organization, speaking about ourselves and trying to make the world a better place because we can really transform these foundations, but we can't do it without you. And that includes adults too. We need all of us intergenerationally. Um, I want to just quickly leave you with a quote from Bayard Rustin, a civil rights leader who is often forgotten in history books. He said, speak truth to power. I urge you all to speak truth to power, and if you have power, speak, speak truth to those with more power. Thank you. Hello, uh, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And you can hear me? Yes. Yeah. Speak yep. Um, yeah, let's see how it's going to bring us. Um, I think I will start by saying welcome to the land of Abenakis. Even though I am an immigrant, I do recognize, and people like me, we recognize that this is a land of the Abenakis. My name is Ali Jang. I am originally from West Africa, Mauritania, and Senegal. I immigrated here in 2008 and ever since lived in the city of Burlington. I became a, an elected official for seven years and worked in so many different programs and with so many different organizations supporting new Americans. And that's the premise in which I will be speaking about today. But first, thank you to the Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner and staff for the invitation. What I believe is together Vermont must renew civic engagement, strengthen trust, civility, and democracy decision-making processes, and empower young Vermonters of color, such as the New Americans. We cannot talk about truth and reconciliation without addressing the issues of post-resettlement. In the state of Vermont, a large portion of local new American population is made up of individuals who are settled in the state as refugee status. Refugees resettlement in the state began in the early 1980s, now making Chittenden County the most ethnically diverse county in the state. Despite significant ongoing demographic changes, opportunities for civic engagement remain vastly inaccessible for New Americans in the area. Prohibited policies and practices around language access along with the lack of education and informational resources and platform to draw New Americans into the democratic processes have led to the mass disenfranchisement of new Americans living in Vermont. There is a critical need for new Americans who are living here, working here, raising children here, to be civically engaged in the spare of the country and communities they rightfully call home. As we all know, the Vermont Attorney General and the State Human Rights Commission Task Force Act 54 of 2017 racial disparity in the state system reports that in addition a likely related in income disparities racial disparities have been documented in the each and every single areas such as education labor employment housing health care economic development the state of vermont also adopted act 9 
Allah creating the racial equity director, a panel of cabinet of level authority. The state legislature intent to the General Assembly is to promote racial justice reform throughout the state by mitigating systemic racism in all system of the government and creating a culture of inclusiveness. That's a key word, a culture of inclusiveness. The same Act 54 state system report explained that addressing these issues also furthers other state goals to the extent of people of color that are fastest, fastest growing demographic in the state. Taking steps to be more inclusive in all aspects of our state system will further economic growth in a time when our workforce is rapidly aging. In other words, equality and opportunities is good for every single one of us. The natives, the Americans, the Abenakis, the white, the black, the brown, each and every single one of us. And as you know, everyone has a story. Our story unearths our shared humanity and have the power to break down oppressive stereotypes. Silencing this power is part of the tyranny of marginalization. In recent years, a new American, the new American community have been devastated. Why? Because of young of a black Somalian who have been killed in Burlington. A young adult from that community was murdered. This strategy has shaken people in the community, at large, the new Americans, communities in particular. The fear of frustration is always palpable. The sense of unjust and discriminatory treatments is also felt. Trust and respect of the government is rapidly raiding in front of age, in front of us. Gun violence and young gang mentality along new American communities are complex and culturally sensitive issues. To address them, it requires different approach regarding the engagement and participation of new American communities. It is, if it's not gun violence, it's the traffic arrest. If it's not the traffic arrest, it's the black children in DCF custody, right? Uh, black people in DCF custody. Youth are desperate to have their needs met. And whenever you hear that a young black man was arrested due to trafficking drug, we should not look any further because of the economic challenges that these communities are, faces, are facing every single day. Not to mention the adequate and important participation in the economy that new Americans are providing. The net fiscal impact of refugee and asylum was positive over the past 15 years. As you know, they have participated $123.8 billion in the economy. And as you know, 31.5 billion of that went to the states and 92 went to the federal government. And this is according to the HHS. As an aging state with almost one third of the population over age 60, it is imperative to strengthen the sense of belonging and engagement of all Vermonters across the lifespan. Especially important to engage young Vermonters our ethnically diverse demographic in our decision-making processes so that they are involved early to see Vermont as a place where they can welcome, they can feel welcomed and valued. Vermont accomplishment in terms of making demographic participation easier, more accessible of all springs. We all know how Vermont also worked entirely to address the COVID-19. We need to continue those um, public health uh, benefits for each and every single one of us. The issue here is that Vermont should not consider the new Americans as an afterthought. 
That's a problem that we encounter every single day in so many decision-making processes. The need <coughs> for accessible information, cultural appropriate material, intention outreach and engagement must be at the forefront of our efforts every single day. We want new Americans of all ages to be empowered to bring their voices and their lived experiences to the key conversations we are having about the future of this great state and the decision being made in the state and local levels will impact our lives. By engaging people with lived experiences in our grants, reviews, in our decision-making processes, we can further strengthen the ability to make real progress toward economic stability, safety, and well-being, resilience for better health. We must embed meaningful participation and opportunities for concrete engagement into all of the deliverable processes. For example, the Green Mountain State has a unique opportunity to harness already established organizations such as the schools, right, the colleges, the, and invite youth and their families in our democratic making processes. I will leave you with this quote from Africa that says, if you want to go fast, you go alone. Yes. But if you want to go far, let's all go together. Yes. Thank you all so much. Come on, Rajni. Can folks here, or those of us who are in the back, can you hear? Okay, so we're just gonna ask folks to project as much as possible when they're up here. Thank you. We're working with the feedback up here. Good afternoon, can you all hear me? Yes. Blessings, my name is Rajni Eddins. It is a gift and a privilege for me to be here with you all today. Someone say, there is power in stories. There is power in stories. That's right, I am a firm believer in this. My mother is the founder of the first black writers group in the Northwest, known as the African American Writers Alliance. So today I'll be sharing two pieces in honor of celebrating our stories and the power and potency they have to transformation in the world. The first one is a dedication and an ode to peace known as, I like there to be a war where nobody came. It's call and response, and it's for the people of Palestine and all people under oppression and suffering world the world over. Say, may the world know peace. May the world know peace. It's call and response, so we know your part, please sing along. I'd like there to be a war where nobody came. I'd like there to be a war where nobody came. Where the gunners didn't show and the flyers didn't flow, like a river carrying death to those below. Where artillery moved too slow, missed the boat and the whole dang show. And we all refused to go, I said, we all refused to go. I'd like there to be a war where nobody came. I'd like there to be a war where nobody came. Where the infantry said no, in clip tones they taste of snow. And the bombers stated clear, they won't go in any year. And sharpshooters closed their eyes, much to the brass great surprise. And there was peace with no reprise. We chose the peace with no reprise. I'd like there to be a war where nobody came. I'd like there to be a war where nobody came. Where we first would check ourselves, see what our causes do foretell, tweak. 
where tweaking would do well, then maybe check ourselves again. Remembering some crazy macho in does not signify a win, cannot signify a win. So I'll say it once again, I'd like there to be a war where I'd like there to be a war where We'd like there to be a war where Wouldn't you? Give it up for yourselves, beautiful. Say, may the world know peace. Say, may the world know peace. May the world know peace. That's right. I do that in honor of my mother, Randy Eddins, who taught me how to speak in uh, more ways than one. So the poem I want to close with now is called Beautiful Sun-Kissed People. Can you say it? Yes. Say it like you mean it. Beautiful sun-kissed people. Say it like, say, say like you love it. Beautiful sun-kissed people. Okay, okay. Say beautiful sun-kissed people. Walking miracles, unfolding parables, ancient scrolls and oceans throws. Love be a rose adorning your ears. This morning will not bring mourning nor a thorn in tears. This forever moment is shorn of fears. Say beautiful sun-kissed people. We are on the cusp of overthrowing overseers. Light years beyond heckles and jeers. No more tanning our hides while Dr. Jekyll steers. This love is sheer, transparent and near, as dears are close as loved ones here. Say, beautiful sun-kissed people. Beautiful sun-kissed people. No conversation on us being equal, just entertaining the thought is evil. We weave full. Fully woven, lost and found, traded and stolen, but look what the eye beholding. Say, beautiful sun-kissed people. Beautiful sun-kissed people. Golden, black and free and ebony, mahogany and mocha bee, chocolate hagen dazs can't see. <laughs> Rivers running melanin, shallow men be monitoring, but most high got it all intents and purposes in sovereign skin. Watch as this here poem ascends, journeying and frolicking. Summer breeze is talking with the autumn wind, how winter just won't break our stride. Too much spring in step for us to hide. Our victory is justified. Say beautiful sun-kissed people. Beautiful sun-kissed people. Solarized with older ties, our currency ain't tokenized. We close to those focused and wise whose feet arise on open skies. We, white supremacy eulogizing, blessed ministry new horizon, and desperate attempts at euphemizing our brilliance with futile lies still will never neutralize. Too many youth been euthanized. Fed sweet as prey to tooth decay, but truthfully our rootful way has truth to say, adorns the night to loose the day, in beauty that the stars obey. Say beautiful sun-kissed people. Beautiful sun-kissed people. And I relate to you so musically, and oh, the joy it brings. Like, please stand and put your hand on your chest. if you're able to. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies of liberty Let our rejoicing rise High as the listening skies, let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. 
Let us march on till victory is won. You may be seated. Let earth and heaven ring in sacred oath, cause after all we are betrothed to wondrous wonders of untold. Great grand good fortune that broke the mold can't buy us off with moldy bread. We've more than crumbs inside our heads and crust just will not satisfy when banquets alone are ours divine. We walk in gourmet grandma made, deliciousness in every shade. Say sun-kissed people. Sun -kissed people. Sun -kissed people. Say beautiful, blessed, bountiful sun-kissed people. Beautiful, blessed, bountiful. Okay, okay. <laughs> I praise the path that plants our flag squarely in earth of self-made basking. A glorious newfound approach that predators cannot encroach. That parasites and wayward folks at a mere glimpse cough and choke. See, this radiance is brighter still than every sun that lights a hill. It calls from something deep within and pours from vocal cords and pen. Say, beautiful sun-kissed people. Beautiful sun-kissed people. I'm nourished just to see you. You furnish my living room with life abundant, killing gloom. You water every plant I have and flourish my gardens green and vast. Sing lullabies to my inner child and soothe all fears of foul defile. You spray me with your sense of grace and lovingly embrace my face. Say, I am you and we are race that founded every human trace. Say, sun kiss people. I wake with your poems on my tongue. In my chest, I hear your drum. From my lips, I hear your hum. It gets me high and drunk as rum. On you, I am forever spun. Your melanin, I'll never shun. Your melanin, I'll never shun. Your melanin, I'll never shun. Has there been better? Never one. Say, sun kiss people. I bequeath these O's to you, your next of kin and children too, and their children's 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 view will yet still match your vibrant hue. You supernatural sorcery to walk in temples gorgeously, shaming cathedrals far and near, make a white Christ pale in the mirror. <laughs> Sun-kissed children, you are it. Don't let nobody tell you shh. Unless they fertilize in soil <laughs> to grow a rose, regal and royal, to don a rose upon a rose of red and black and green and gold, so poetically bestowed, it dignifies your inner throne. Sun kissed children, marvelous, miraculous magnificence, outlandishly so unabashed, unapologetic sass, ultra magnetic blackness, the right goddess on your epitaph. That's blasphemy, surely, right? Because we know true gods never die. Sun-kissed children, you kiss my eyes with all that sunshine you applying. I say I'm in love for true, because you are me and I am you. From head to toe and all between, I love these princes, kings, and queens. I even find you in my dreams. And when I wake, I vow to breathe. Breathe in. And breathe to vow. Breathe out. With every vowel and consonant I can pronounce, Announce the cosmos all your feats. Build castles for your sweet retreats. Goose feathered pillows, black satin sheets. A sacred lounge to rest your crown from all them wounds been crying out. Sun kissed people have no doubt. You're all I am, what I'm about. Can't tell my story without your page. Every chapter be erased. You sew my line so seamlessly. We vibe on higher frequency. So let's not love in secrecy. My sun-kissed people, 
We be the key. Blessings, y'all. Make some noise. Yeah. Say power to the people. Yeah. Say power to the people. Yeah. Say power to the people. Yeah. All right. That is a hard act to follow. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank the Vermont Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Commissioners Mackin and Schultz for inviting me to speak my truth. My name is Beth Davis. My, <laughs> my pronouns are she and her. I live in rural Addison County with my husband and our 42-year-old son who is on the autism spectrum. People with disabilities are the victims of systemic discrimination, otherwise known as ableism. Although we publicly declare that people with disabilities deserve the same opportunities as everyone else, the reality is that they are unconsciously thought of as inferior people, retards, degenerates. The unalienable rights codified in our Declaration of Independence of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are not and were not intended to be available to people with disabilities. Let me give you a little history. Decades ago, when I was a child, individuals with physical, intellectual, and developmental disabilities were invisible. They were considered to be inferior to other people. They were either segregated in school or did not even go to school. They lived with their families who kept them insulated or hidden from the world or they were hidden away in institutions. Then in 1975, Public Law 94142 was passed, which guaranteed a free and public education for children with disabilities. For the first time, children with disabilities were given the right to a public education. This was groundbreaking but these children were segregated in special classrooms where they were still hidden from public view. PL 94142 morphed into the Individuals with Disabilities Act, or IDEA, which required public schools to provide a free and appropriate education to eligible children with disabilities in the least restrictive environment that is appropriate for their needs. The least restrictive environment is one that allows the child to interact with non-disabled students as much as possible. Separate schooling was only allowed when the dis disability severity or nature made it impossible to achieve instructional goals in the regular classroom. This meant that children with disabilities were no longer hidden or invisible. And it, the laws were game changers. They weren't perfect, but they were game changers for individuals, for children with disabilities. However, adults with disabilities continued to be invisible and systemically discriminated against. In 1999, the Supreme Court decided in the Olmstead v. L.C. case that segregating people with disabilities was a form of discrimination under the Americans with Disabilities Act. We were making some progress. So what do you think what life was like for people with disabilities in the state of Vermont during this time? The Brandon Training School was opened in 1915 to provide care with individual, for individuals with disabilities. 
Although the Brandon Training School was built to address the needs of these individuals, the common practice of eugenics isolated them from the community and included involuntary sterilization. Eugenics is a pseudoscientific field of human breeding that became popular in the early 1900s. Vermont was one of many states, actually one of the leaders, that adopted eugenics, eugenics as a basis for public policies, including sterilization of at least 250 Vermonters, family separation, and institutionalization. These policies targeted vulnerable Vermonters and caused widespread intergenerational damage. In 1993, before the Olmsted decision, the state of Vermont decided to close the Brandon Training School to stop the practice of segregating people with disabilities. 2,324 people lived in the Brandon Training School between 1915 and 1993. Families were assured that the residents of the training school would be cared for by the state. The Vermont plan was to integrate individuals with disabilities into their local community, primarily by having them live with shared living providers. Originally, most of these providers were staff from the Brandon Training School. This seemed like a sensible solution, and it was for some people. A friend of mine describes a different situation. Her cousin resided at the Brandon Training School, and when the school closed, a home provider could not be found for her. She was forced to move into a home with her elderly father, who was psychologically abusive toward her. Today, According to a research brief commissioned by Vermont Act 186, at this time, right now, there are over 600 individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities who need supportive housing in Vermont. These are adults who need supportive housing in Vermont. The closing of the training school created an overreaction by state social services and their designated agencies when creating rules regarding housing choices for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. The state of Vermont has been stuck in this philosophy, in the philosophy that one model fits all and that the shared living provider model is the best. It's certainly the cheapest model for people with disabilities. It is essentially foster care for adults with minimal oversight by the state and virtually zero training and accountability. I know this for a fact because my son has lived with two shared living providers, neither of which lasted more than two years. Another issue is that many shared living providers live in rural areas resulting in very limited access to the community. A few people also live in group homes, but it is not an ideal setting for many people. The idea of the least restrictive environment, which has long applied to public schools, seems to be, have been ignored when it comes to adults with disabilities. The reality is that the state of Vermont relies on the least expensive housing solution for adults with disabilities, that is, their parents and families. In 2014, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services set forth the rules regarding the qualities for a home and community-based setting for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. To summarize, the home setting must give the individual full access to the greater community. It must be selected by the individual from many setting options. It must ensure their right of privacy, dignity, and respect. It must provide initiative, autonomy, and independence in making life choices. 
it must ensure individual choice regarding services and supports. Vermont is bound by law to adhere to these rules set forth by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. But clearly these rules are not being followed. Individuals have very little choice in the freedoms outlined by the rules. Many of the individuals who live with home providers have very limited autonomy. Since the primary housing solutions offered by the state of Vermont are shared living providers and a very small number of group homes, most adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities live with their aging parents, a situation which is neither sustainable nor fair. The promise by Governor Dean back in 1993 that all of Vermont's individuals with disabilities would be taken care of after the closing of Brandon Training School needs to be honored by our state government. It is a crime that over 600 adults with disabilities in Vermont still need housing. Now I've only addressed housing in my comments. However, there are also limitations in employment for individuals with disabilities. The reasons for this are complicated, but one of the primary factors is the lack of innovative paths to employment. We seem to be stuck in a one-size-fits-all method for finding employment. Once again, creativity and innovation is lacking, which is a grave disservice to adults with disabilities and their families. People with disabilities also face many challenges to achieving optimal health and accessing high quality health care. According to the Centers for Disease Control, data from 2019 shows that compared to people without disabilities, people with disabilities have less access to health care, have more depression and anxiety, engage more often in risky health behaviors such as smoking and are less physically active. The state of Vermont needs to study these issues and brainstorm ways to give individuals with disabilities greater access to health care. The non-compliance of the state of Vermont regarding adults with disabilities means that the responsibility of the well-being of these individuals falls to their families. Parents have recently organized to convince the legislature that more needs to be done. And if any of you are interested in knowing about any of these efforts, please let me know. It is time for the state of Vermont to take the lead in thinking outside of the box and giving financial incentives for local agencies who serve an individual with, dis with disabilities to innovate and brainstorm new solutions that give their clients a choice in where to live and where to work. This should not be the responsibility of their parents and families. As baby boomer parents age, this crisis will only get worse. The state of Vermont needs to own this crisis that was created by their lack of planning for the future and continued subconscious mindset, which is the legacy of the eugenics movement, that people with disabilities are inferior. Vermont needs to guarantee the rights of people with disabilities to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To do anything less is blatant hypocrisy. Thank you. I guess I have to hang on to this uh, microphone because I don't talk very loud. Can you hear me? Medake ape. Shante washte chahuzahe. 
I greet you all today with a good heart. My name is Beverly Little Thunder Wakia Chichia, or what my people call me. My mother was Christina Marshall Inichiapie, which is what her people call her. And my grandmother was Bessie Mato Numpa, two bears, Inichiape, which is what her people called her. Among my people, when we begin to address a crowd, we always talk about who our relatives were. I was asked to come here today and to speak, and I've thought a lot about it ever since I was asked. And the word that kept coming to mind was truth. Truth and reconciliation. How can we have reconciliation without truth? The government of Vermont certainly has not been totally truthful. It has many, many examples of harm that have been created and perpetuated on people of color. I have been here for 20 years, and I found out that there had been a large black community just several miles from where I live. There continues to be a cemetery there of black individuals that live there. I don't see our government acknowledging that or doing anything to preserve that. Oh, but wait, it's not Arlington. Oh, forgive me. It was just a little cemetery. A little cemetery with individuals that lived here in Vermont long before any of us did, who worked this land, who raised their children here. I'm told that the last family that left Huntington, Vermont was in 1960. I was a child in 1960, but I was alive, as many of you were. Currently, our government doesn't do much to do its homework. It seems more set on making sure that things go across their desk and are signed and become bills and become the law with as little effort as possible. Appointing a commission that is supposed to be looking at truth and reconciliation is a good way for our government not to have to look any further but to pass it on to another body of people. They have not done their homework. They have not looked into the history of the state because sometimes looking at history is painful. It's not always the most popular thing to do. I hear and see a lot of people who say, oh, that was a long time ago. But it wasn't a long time ago. It continues today. It affects the children of today. It affects the citizens of Vermont today. The lies that have been perpetuated and sanctioned by this administration 
are horrible. I think that as citizens of Vermont, we need to demand better from our lawmakers. I think that we need to remember our history and remember that the Constitution that so many people fall back on was written for white men who had a lot of money and land and slaves. And we need to recognize how that has continued up until today. It's no coincidence that we have so many black people in prison. It's no coincidence that every time you hear about a crime being committed, the first thing you hear someone say is it must have been a black person or an immigrant. I want to remind you that you're all immigrants. You're all immigrants on this land. And now you have a responsibility to ensure that history is told from a viewpoint that is honest and truthful. Among the Lakota, our value systems include honesty and truthfulness. I don't know how to be any other way. I spent a lot of time doing research. I spent a lot of time talking to people who do research. I spent a lot of time looking into the eugenics movement here. And like the sister just said, a lot of people who were deemed to be less than perfect were victims of sterilization and that horrible, horrible time in history. And it still continues to today. Maybe not in terms of sterilization, but in terms of not having access to health care, to social events, not being able to even leave their homes in many cases. Reconciliation begins with truth. The myths and the lies that families pass on through generations oftentimes have dark places that they come from. But I happen to know that institutions like our healthcare system, like our educational system, keep meticulous records. And those records are there for anybody to look at if you just know where to go. I look around and I don't see anybody from Odenak and Molenek who are also Abenaki people who lived here, died here, and worked this land, and who left to escape the Civil War and headed north. Headed north before there was a border. We did not recognize or make those borders. They were imposed upon us. So those citizens there should be here. We're talking about reconciliation. They should be here talking about the harm that has been done to their communities. And the only question that I want to leave with is was the TRC formed and asked to define something 
that those that sit in this building behind me found too uncomfortable. That they didn't want to take the time to do. And the more important thing is because there was no money in it. But there is money in becoming a BIPOC person. There is status in being a BIPOC person in the white world. And in Vermont, that is where we stand today. As a Lakota woman, I have come here from a long, long way away. But this is my home. For 20 years, I have lived here. I will die here. I will be buried here. It doesn't make me any less indigenous than anyone who lived here 300 years ago. And so I ask, I ask the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to look hard at the strategic plan that you have come up with. Does it center one particular group of people? Or is it truly inclusive of all of us? of everyone who lives in Vermont. And that's all I ask. And since today's coming out day, I'm a two-spirit woman! if I'm using this correctly, but I hope so. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, I just want to start by saying I'm honored and humbled to be here today amongst all of you lovely people here in the community and amongst you leaders in our state um, and very, very prolific people that have been up here speaking. I'm very, very humbled to be among the speakers today. So thank you so much for having me. My name is Tiffany and I am a formerly incarcerated single mother of five boys. And um, I'm here today because as a formerly incarcerated person, I have a lot of thoughts about <laughs> what should be going on with the carceral state. There's a saying by the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls that says nothing about us without us. What that means is that there shouldn't be decisions made about people without them being allowed to have some kind of input or being at that table to share what their experiences are. Um, and too often decisions are made about incarcerated people without any input from them or any consideration of their experiences. Too often we're overlooked or brushed off because we deserve what we get, quote unquote, from society. But what people don't see is the harm that occurs simply from being incarcerated or institutionalized at all. Personally, I have mental health conditions which plague me um, daily due to being treated as less than by DOC. I remember times when different COs would come in for trainings and certain COs who were training them basically taught them that we were animals in a zoo. They talked incred incredibly negatively about us right in front of us, like we weren't even there, like we weren't people. They were told that they didn't use the same water cooler to fill their water bottles as us because we were disgusting and likely diseased. They saw this in front of everybody, mind you. One of my best friends, um, this is actually, I just wanna say this really quickly. This might be a trigger warning for, for some people. So I apologize if step off, if you know, you're triggered. Um, one of my best friends was raped in her cell while everyone else was at breakfast or asleep. When she complained about it to the supervisor, she was told that it wasn't rape, it was theft of service. 
because of her past as a sex worker. And then it was laughed off as she departed, horrified from the surprise office. When I was wrongfully accused of possessing illegal drugs and my belongings and put in solitary confinement, the whole, without access to phones, books, writing supplies, and recreation for 10 days, and included missing visits with my children, and was then found not to be guilty of it, <laughs> I wasn't given an I'm sorry or anything like that. Instead, I got moved to a different unit after another three days of waiting in solitary, even though I was comfortable where I was. The bottom line is, once you're involved with the Department of Corrections, you're no longer afforded the same rights as other citizens. They can literally do whatever they want to you, and no one believes you or cares. And most people are just unaware because out of sight, out of mind, right? That seems to be the prevalent mindset. Most incarcerated people are considered to be forgotten about. They're in jail, they're fine, and then, you know, they, people just go on with their lives and forget about them. When released, we face tremendous battles with housing, employment, prejudices, prejudices, discrimination, and poor treatment by the general public. Not to mention the countless demands by your PO who can come up with rules on a whim that you have to follow. There's no one who actually checks and balances the probation and parole officers. Then we fight to keep our families together and healthy, even though oftentimes irreparable damage has already been done. My two oldest sons have severe mental health issues which correlate directly with my incarceration. One of my sons was adopted out by DCF while I was incarcerated, and I was there simply for lack of residence. Why is it okay to act like we don't exist? Like our experiences aren't real? Like we're not human? Let's not forget the countless individuals, almost all my close friends from prison, who are now dead from the opioid epidemic, or homeless because of a housing crisis and lack of resources. I propose we come together as a community and completely dismantle the incarcerated system in favor of alternative, more holistic measures that don't allow for the destruction of one's life and future, as well as their families. COSA, Pathways Vermont, just to name a couple examples, could become alternatives that provide wraparound services um, as well as accountability for the individual. There's so many exciting ideas out there that would help instead of harm incarcerated and formerly incarcerated folks. We need to remember that all of our community members are there, not just a select few. The time to join forces and speak up and speak out against grave injustices is now. I will not rest until all people are treated equally and with respect. And I hope you'll join me in the fight for what's right. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. Thank you so much for having me here today and for listening. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? I want to thank you all who stay, who stay till the end of the program. I want to thank the Vermont Commission for Truth and Reconciliation for asking me to be here. My name is Sha'an Moulier. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the coordinator for I Am Vermont 2, a program of the Root social justice system. So, I'm sorry, social justice center. I Am Vermont 2 is a statewide photo story project centered on BIPOC who share their experiences through art. I Am Vermont 2 provides a necessary platform for black, indigenous, and people of color in Vermont to raise awareness and education about racial microaggressions and their impact on their lives. Why? What's the purpose? It's a vehicle where our humanity is visible, our experiences are validated, and our contributions to the community are valued. I use a photo booth is what I call where people uh, get their photos taken. It's an opportunity to educate and explain what a microaggression is. Simply put, when an experience makes you feel 
less than. Many have experienced this. They didn't know how to name it. Some of our common themes, hair, the most common theme. Where are you from? And what is your race? Common responses, I didn't know. White people not knowing, lack of exposure or ignorance. BIPOC not knowing, others felt like them. They identified and found connection. How do we convey information? Whose lens? Whose narrative? From my perspective, growing up in the 50s and 60s, white people mm, didn't really like the way, uh, uh, like themselves. And I found that from the way they were treating uh, black and brown people. So, you know, that golden rule, treat others the way you want them to treat you? Well, that was my conclusion. So we talk about the platinum rule that says treat others the way they want to be treated. Well, we already know how the dominant culture wants to be treated. So this only works when the dominant culture is willing to treat others the way the other wants to be treated. I'm currently in the process of curating the 2025 I Am Vermont Two State House exhibit, which will be displayed at the cafeteria, the State House here, in February, Black History Month. Looking through the collection, it saddens me how many no longer reside in Vermont. Their humanity wasn't seen. Their experiences weren't validated and their contributions to the community were not valued. They did not feel safe for themselves or their children and as an international college student said to me, Vermonters have guns. So as you're putting out welcome and that we all want to come together, this is what our international students are feeling. And there are those who stay, who make Vermont their home, and are valuable resources and contributors to our brave little state. In 2001, I attended the UN World Conference Against Racism in Durban, South Africa as a delegate and we were charged with truth, reparations, restoration, and reconciliation. I am Vermont too, and others are here today, and we're sharing our truth. Wounds need to be cleansed before they can heal. Hence, reparations for black people and restoration of the land for indigenous people before we can reconcile. On my way back from Durban, South Africa, I landed at JFK. At the airport, we heard that the towers had been hit. Game on. So much for being able to implement our charge. I didn't know there was so much money around. The African American Alliance did not get any of it. As a matter of fact, money dried up. We could no longer be an entity, which meant we could no longer advocate, organize, educate, and support African Americans and their families living in the Northeast Kingdom. I have, so what are we going to do with this? Oh, I already said that. So when we think of 
how we relay information. I facilitated many racial literacy, a healing practice training for white people. The goal being to establish a foundational understanding, a shared understanding. Good intentions had common ground, but not a common history. The outcome was participants dropped out of the training. One group didn't even complete the training. Today, more than ever, we have access to information. Again, whose narrative? And then there's AI. Moving forward, how do we develop a common history? I have a saying, approach life's challenges with grace. The acronym for grace, gratitude, reflection, adapt, create and engage. Practice cultural humility, which is a commitment to lifelong learning through critical self-reflection. Recognize, acknowledge and challenge the power imbalance. Engage in institutional accountability. In conclusion, as soon as I find that in conclusion, <laughs> okay. What is your takeaway? Has it changed your thinking or your approach? How will you use this information that you have heard today? Will it just be another voyeuristic experience? Will it be a seed for thought? Will it be a change agent? When the rights of the smallest minority are protected, the lives of the majority benefit. Ashe. Thank you so, so much to all the speakers and to all of you for being here. You're wonderful and I hear you. Okay, and the last piece is we have made, oh, well, I shouldn't say we, one of our interns, Julia Baker, who's amazing, and Araya Hol Holyman have uh, worked on a timeline and they just started it. So um, we had it here and there's so many people with edits already <laughs> that we want everyone to be invited to help us create the common memory. So a timeline is a super easy, very accessible way to just look at history. What's been left out? How can we start this process together? So this is something easy and quick that everybody can do together and uh, we want everybody's voices. So um, please send us edits. We'll put it up on our website. We have some copies there. So. Uh, we would love to hear from you. And um, Beverly mentioned that um, it's important to do research and to know where things are. And um, we are going to be doing an event on November 6th from 10 to 2 with the archives. And uh, we invite everybody to come. So if you want to learn what they have, where you can get certain records, then it's open to the public and we'll have folks there to share. So. Everybody, please come and thank you so, so much. Uh, this is your Vermont process. It's at the Vermont State Archives, which is in, which is in Middlesex. Middlesex. Yeah, and if uh, I will be transporting some folks, um, so if people need rides, we might be able to coordinate. So, um, anyway, thank you so, so much. And thank you all. yeah, that is. Thank you all for coming and thank you all for staying. It was long. We're gonna have record of it on Orca TV. Special shout out to them, and once again, shout out to our um, our uh, People's Kitchen, who nourished us today, and all our speakers who nourished our souls. Thank you again. Thank you.